Hi, my name is Alex Williams, founder of The New Stack, and you are listening to The New Stack Analyst Podcast. Each week, we look at application development and management at scale. Our sponsor this week is DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is a simple cloud hosting platform built for developers. You can find them at digitalocean.com. That's D I G I T A L O C E A N. Now let's get to the show. Hey, Alex Williams of the New Stack here for the New Stack Analyst Show. Today we are talking with Daniel Saltzman, Social Media Manager at DigitalOcean, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Joe Jackson, Managing Editor at the New Stack. Hey, guys. Good to have you here today. Thanks for having me. Great. So, uh, Daniel, our topic today is the Hacktoberfest that DigitalOcean did. Perhaps you can explain that to us, and then we'd like to get into the data a little bit uh, to understand some of the dynamics that you saw, um, you know, in this uh, project that you did. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Hacktoberfest, uh, just from a high level, is a month-long event encouraging people to contribute to open source. It's simple as that what we do is we add a gamified component to it where people have to do a certain amount of coding in order to receive a free custom limited edition t-shirt from us Um, and so this is our second year putting on Hacktoberfest last year we had the the qualification requirement was to put in 50 commits and this year we decided to go with four pull requests um, to a any open source project of your choosing and so Hacktoberfest is something that we partnered up with GitHub on this year, and uh, it's become, it was way more successful than we expected, but uh, I'm excited to talk to you about it uh, here today. Terrific. So, uh, so you went from uh, 50 commits to four pull requests. So why did you decide to, to make that change? Well, there were a few reasons. We wanted to uh, inc- increase the quality of the, of the code that was going to be uh, contributed. We found that last year people saw the 50 commits as an opportunity to write a script potentially and kind of cheat the system in a way. Um, we obviously always have an honor code system where we just openly say like, listen, you could do whatever you want, but this is in the spirit of open source. So let's, you know, let's all play fair. For pull requests was an opportunity to challenge that idea and see, well, if we do full pull requests, well, actually now that you're contributing, you know, code that's going to be Uh, reviewed and potentially merged, is the quality going to go up? And so this year, uh, we definitely saw that effect. We definitely saw a lot of good contributions, which I'll be happy to talk about. Um, But at the same time, you're never going to get past some people actually just doing it for the free shirt, you know? Right. Uh, One one quick question. Uh, What is the difference between a commit and a pull request? And why is a pull request a bit more challenging? Well, the pull request is going to be something that um, we anticipate. I mean, we set up the community, we tried to get them, uh, make it as easy as possible for them. So when they entered the Hacktoberfest program, we immediately set them up with tutorials or basically suggested and featured projects, a way for them to go right into a project and see how they can contribute. And so with a pull request, you can uh, check out what bugs are available and how you can contribute to fixing them. There might be documentation that needs editing or new documentation contributed. Um, You might want to write a whole new feature for a project. And so the, 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 the code that we saw included there was a combina- a variable of those three. And so, you know, it's, it's more thought put into each pull request than literally just the commit, which is a very systematic process uh, in Git. Uh, what data did you get out of that, um, you know, um, out of the uh, project in the first year compared to the second year? So last, yeah, it's kind of crazy to look at the numbers because last year, 800 people entered and about 500 of them actually had the 50 commits. And so that's how many we actually sent shirts to, which was really exciting for us. First year trying this out and there was a lot of excitement around it. This year, we jumped up to about 15,000 people signing up. And because you, when you have so many people sign up, you obviously are going to have a lesser percentage of conversion. 
So we had about um, almost 6,000 people who actually had full pull requests. So we're looking at 800 to 15,000 as far as just people signing up and 500 to 5,000 or 5,700 um, as far as people actually receiving a t-shirt. Hmm. So why do you account for the, the, the jump? What are some of the reasons you account for that jump? I mean, one basic thing that, you know, I can't go and mention is the partnership with GitHub. GitHub, we saw, uh, you know, GitHub, we've been, we've worked with GitHub on other projects. And so we brought GitHub in to work on Hacktoberfest and the promotional component, you know, with us, obviously a year, it's another year of DigitalOcean being around and us continuing to grow our Twitter following and our community. Um, and same goes for GitHub. So when we came back this year, we were obviously able to not only reach out to the people that participated last year, but also reach out to a much wider community that we've been working on developing throughout the year. Why would you, why did you guys do this? Why did we do Hacktoberfest? Yeah. Well, Dio loves open source because we're built on open source. Uh, and, you know, the project, some things that, you know, Dio uses Ruby and Go. Uh, we're contributing to technologies like Prometheus on the monitoring side. Um, internally, we have, we also work on Drone as another example of project in open source that we use. So there's definitely excitement around open source as far as how we are, you know, what that looks like. We think about that a lot. And when the community team thinks about it, we want to just, you know, not only bring uh, existing people into contributing to open source more, but also bring a lot of new people uh, into open source. And that's kind of what we saw with Hacktoberfest. One thing that we did this year a little bit differently is at the end of it, we asked for, asked for testimonials. What was Hacktoberfest like for you? And, you know, if you'd like me to share, I have a few stories, but uh, there are some really interesting uh, case studies of people coming into the open source world for the first time, um, experienced people as well. And really, that's, that's the stuff that we're doing it for. We love hearing those stories, and it was really great to see a lot of them come out of this year's Hacktober Fest. So these were uh, developers who really haven't uh, contributed that much to the open source community before, or were they uh, um, long time uh, open source, the, the lone guy in the basement sort of thing who wants to the uh, t-shirt, or it sounds like it's a combination of both. Yeah, it was, it was definitely a combination of experienced and, and beginner developers. Uh, it was really awesome to see engineers working in, on CERN uh, contribute during Hacktoberfest. We saw projects like Facebook, Microsoft, Google, actually merge PRs. Uh, as far as the projects that were contributed to, in addition, were I saw Kubernetes in there, which is really interesting, Homebrew, Rust, Django, Go. So these all, you know, these are a little bit more, these projects are prominent, and they require, you know, an experienced developer to be involved. And so we saw that, but then we also saw people say, thanks so much, uh, DigitalOcean and GitHub, for inspiring me to put in my first PRs uh, for me to contribute to open source for the very first time. So what did the people say about it? What are some of the things they did say? What did they say? Okay, so I have, I have um, a developer from Krakow. I thought this was uh, a pretty interesting one. He said he dropped out of college because he couldn't sustain himself financially and had to go to work. Uh, in his spare time, he started learning how to code and a couple of months back, finally landed his first developer job. He always wanted to contribute to open source projects but haven't had the courage to do so. Hacktoberfest encouraged him to, to just start doing it. Uh, so he says, I started by writing documentation for Ember.js, my currently favorite JavaScript framework. I'm glad that I did that. I feel I'm part of the worldwide developer community. And then he just closed it out with the experience has been great. And I've learned that open source projects are not as scary as I thought. In fact, they're not scary at all. Everyone's been super nice to me the whole time. What, what is it about that scariness? And what, what do you guys think about that? You know, this fear that people have about open source, you hear about it a lot. As, and, and how how is this effort that you're you know, that you as you did here reflective of you know of of what DigitalOcean is trying to do to help alleviate that? Yeah, it's a really good question, Alex. Because uh, obviously, even as the developer space and open source is evolving, this still has exactly what you, it's still there's still a lot of that perception, and there's a lot of that still happening um, in open source. Where DigitalOcean comes in is from our background and our, um, you know, our vision is coming from a place of love. Uh, we talk about love a lot internally. We talk about community a lot as well. And so while it sometimes might be, you know, uh, you know, not the place for it, we certainly are coming with those intentions in mind. 
what we learned this year, what I personally learned kind of uh, product managing the whole thing was we definitely need to have more conversations with maintainers and the community from the get-go. We, we should be listening to people's stories and hearing all sides of the equation and going from there. Um, so, you know, fundamentally our community is built um, on welcoming beginners and helping them grow. So that's why Hacktoberfest made sense. Hmm. I guess there's a per- perception of, uh, if, I, if I don't cope with this correctly, uh, Linus Torvalds will, will yell at me. Uh, but is that, I mean, for open source projects, is that a prevailing condition or is it, um, is it kind of a wider community than that sort of mindset? Why not bring new, why not bring more new people into the community and help them uh, kind of paint a new picture uh, and kind of add their perspective to it as well? Uh, I think that more voices, you know, it's not, it's not that there's more chefs in the kitchen, uh, it's just more smart people in the room to add their own ideas. I think that, you know, we saw so much positive feedback and so much, uh, so many new, new faces to open source that had a very positive first uh, experience through Hacktoberfest. Then, you know, our hope is that we can continue to, uh, to not only bring those beginners, but now start talking to more experienced, uh, you know, start bringing in experts uh, in the open source community into DigitalOcean and help, you know, guide us as we continue to grow and, you know, and get involved in different sorts of projects like this. So my question is, how did you prepare the maintainers for this project? So they were, so they'd be prepared. Did you have to, do you, do you take any special, um, you know, measures to, you know, get them ready for this uh, contest? The way that we prepped the maintainers was um, John, who I was working with from GitHub on this. We actually reached out to uh, the projects that we featured, uh, which we started with the idea of featuring 31 projects for 31 days in October. But uh, for whatever reasons that, for whatever reason I got a little sloppy there at the end, we ended up featuring about 35 or so. So John and I reached out to each of the um, core maintainers, one of the core maintainers, just to let them know that, you know, we're thinking of doing this Hacktoberfest thing and featuring you guys. Please let us know if this is something you're interested in. Uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll be happy to not include you if now is not a good time to be featured in something like this. Uh, and just started that conversation. The learning lesson, Alex, is definitely do that earlier uh, next year. Uh, okay. What kind of questions did they have? What, what's going to be the promotional, uh, you know, how, how, big is, how, how big is this really going to be? I think that we, as I told you, we didn't even expect that it would be this successful. So it's about setting those expectations for them as well. Hmm. Because there's a lot of work that comes in if there's going to be that many more people who are participating in the projects. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just to, just to throw uh, a stat in there, you know, one of the pro- – overall, there were people from 85 countries that participated. Uh, and the amount of projects that were involved, 17,000, and there were 48,000 pull requests. So we're looking at a lot of action, and a lot of them were, a lot of, a lot of projects actually got, the, you know, a, a very high amount of those pull requests. I believe one project actually got up to 600. Fortunately, it was mostly documentation-based, um, but still, that's something that a project maintainer definitely needs to be prepared for and be completely open with us uh, if they want to just opt out, it's not a problem at all. You know, one of the things that we started to see in these open source communities, especially as open source becomes more popular, we see uh, a, uh, a deeper complexity in how to actually manage the open source projects. It seems like that your Hacktoberfest is almost like a microcosm of that. Yeah, I agree with you on that, absolutely. Um, it's a microcosm within a microcosm. It's really just... A, a very small uh, piece of the bigger puzzle and still a testing ground for us. Um, one thing that was really nice to see was maintainers reach out to us throughout the month. If you, if you search hash, hashtag Hacktoberfest on Twitter, you'll see a lot of projects using that feed as an opportunity to get uh, more contributions. And so one thing that we're thinking about is, well, why not next year when we do this, why not open it up to other projects to just maybe even uh, – upload their own project and be able to uh, empower others to contribute to them without us being a barrier. Why don't we empower others to just you know, get up there and share? So that's one of the thoughts that we had. It's basically just sticking to the um, ideas of, 
you know, coming from a place of love, which is what DigitalOcean is based on, and um, also just learning quickly as we go. Of the projects that you uh, chose, how did you choose these two particular projects? Were they um, uh, were they in dire need of more contributions, or were they popular projects, or what was the thinking going on there? There's a few things. Uh, we wanted to do a various uh, selection of languages. When you visit Hacktoberfest um, today, you'll see that you can sort by the language. We wanted to make sure that we include projects that had different purposes. So, you know, there were various types of projects on there. And lastly, we wanted projects that were would have some experience and would be prepared for, you know, the more increased human contributions. Now let's take a quick break before we get back to the second half of the show. This week our sponsor is Digital Ocean. Digital Ocean is a simple cloud posting platform built for developers. You can find them at digitalocean.com. That's D-I-G-I-T-A-L-O-C-E-A-N.com. Now let's get back to the show. So which pro- which project uh, had the most uh, participation? Which of those 31 projects that you selected had the most participation? Learn X and Y minutes. Uh, it's basically code documentation written as code is their, is their tagline. Um, and it, that was the by far the most contributed to. But actually, that's an interesting, it's interesting that that happened because it highlights that non-developers can give back to open source as well. Then a few projects that weren't featured that were actually some of the most contributed to were Salt Stack um, with uh, AngularJS and Homebrew. So those are just a few that weren't featured. Okay, thank God. They actually, the people decided they wanted to participate in. Yeah. And so LearnX and Y and Y Minutes is a, I'm looking at it now. Um, it's a whirlwind tour of several hopefully many someday, popular and ought to be more popular programming languages preserved as valid, commented code, and explained as they go. Why, so can you tell us me again some why, why this was so popular? As, as I was saying, Hacktoberfest also brings in a lot of, new deve- a lot of non-developers into being developers, uh, or people that just have not had the confidence to contribute to open source. Uh, I think that's why a project like this stands out because for the beginners, documentation is an easier barrier to entry, a lower barrier to entry. Right. Right. And that makes a lot of sense. So the categories you chose were uh, bash, C, C++, C sharp, coffee script, you want on documentation, go JavaScript, no PHP, uh, Python and Ruby. There's a note. So, what about um, any Java-related projects did, that are not necessarily represented there? There are certainly Java projects that aren't uh, represented there, and there are other languages that we didn't include as well. And that's something that we're gonna, you know, that's something that we're gonna look into and see how we're gonna improve on next year. People reached out to us very quickly, commenting that C Sharp wasn't included, and fortunately, it was before we launched, so we made that adjustment. So we were really learning as we went, um, and the feature projects was almost a test to see if, you know, what's the value that we could deliver by doing featured projects. And I think it showed that by providing featured projects, you give contributors a starting off point, just a, a, a gateway into GitHub projects where they can roam freely and maybe uh, venture off into something that may be a little bit more interesting. But this is just a starting point. Of the, uh, I'm kind of curious, of the, uh, of the pull request, what were, do, you, do any, of, any of them come to mind as being particularly exceptional? Like you saw them, you thought, well, I didn't think anybody would pull this off. Uh, was, was there anything unusual in the entries? Well, I definitely wasn't expecting uh, engineers from CERN to, to be involved, in, in <laughs> which was cool. Uh, as I mentioned, Prometheus is a, is a really uh, awesome project. It was a featured project as well. And, you know, the Prometheus team said that they saw, they saw bug, bug fixes. They saw documentation changes. Uh, so hearing from some of the maintainers that the contributions they received were meaningful, that for us was very impactful. As far as 
pull requests, all those 48,000 48, PRs. Uh, we have not looked at that side of the data yet. I still have a lot of uh, a lot of testimonials to look through, and there's still a lot of more data. I would actually be interested from you guys what other data points you'd be interested in seeing. Hmm. I, I I think it's interesting data. We'd love to take a look at it ourselves to uh, do some analysis on it. I think one of the things that we're finding, at least, is you know Joe knows this more than I do. Is when we do we're starting to do more analysis of open source communities. You know, and the GitHub API can only tell you so much, right? So you end up having to take, um, you know, information from the GitHub API and then, you know, feed it into another API, you know, so you can get another, so you can generate a new data set. And so, you know, Joe, if you can talk to us a little bit about the work you've done with Lawrence and kind of the things that you found with the open source projects that we've been analyzing better than I can. What are some of the things that you and Lawrence have been seeing, you know, in your analysis of these groups? Well, uh, well, Lawrence was doing most of the, the, the uh, heavy lifting in that regard. We're, we're, we're putting together a um, uh, data analysis piece on um, the amount of control that a single party might have over, um, might have over uh, a, a particular software project. And when we think of open, so open source, you think of a community project uh, along the lines of uh, Linux or OpenStax as another good example. But uh, at least in the realms of um, enterprise software, uh, a lot of the uh, we've, we're finding that a lot of the um, large open source projects uh, um, uh, are tend to be dominated by a single company. Uh, this is either kind of intentional, like Oracle with MySQL, or uh, you might have examples where, uh, like Kubernetes, for instance, which is in you know in theory a a, a community project, though. Google is still driving uh, most of the changes in that community. It, it's, but it, it's, it, it can be a challenge to figure out who is contributing to these projects because I think GitHub, if I understand this correctly, GitHub doesn't allow for company affiliations and um, some of the work that Scott's been doing has been to uh, uh, you know, figure out who, who, is behind, uh, who is behind these commits. Is it, um, you know, is it a, a company employee or is it uh, an independent? Uh, contributor and uh, yeah so that's basically um, yeah that, that's the challenges we've been having with working with github it, it's a fantastic source of, of uh, information but we still want to kind of uh, uh, extend it out with other sources yeah I absolutely agree with you on that and that's why you know that's one of the reasons why we partnered with them and I, 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 I want to open it up to to anyone in the space who wants to work with us on this. That's, you know, I created Hacktoberfest at DigitalOcean.com as an email so people can reach out if they're interested. Um, but, you know, you, you're, you're working on some interesting things there. And, I, and you know, we should, we should even work together, Joe, on, um, you know, seeing where, where there's opportunity for collaboration. Yeah, I think uh, the, the data, I mean, that's a great data set that you guys are de developed out of. This it seems to me one of the most interesting things to go you know, one of the things we're trying to find out is, you know, as Joe say, you know, what are, you know, what are the nuances of open source of the open source community? Um, because we think we use open source so broadly, right, um, as a term, um, but uh, we we don't really take the time to understand what's the differences between different these open source projects. Um, it seems like you guys were very purposeful in the ones you chose. Um, you know, I don't see any, I mean, I see them very related, you know, related to, you know, programming languages, right, as you stated. Um, but not anything, you know, nothing like an enterprise software project that you would see, you know, that as Job was uh, mentioning. I think that reflects in the differences in the community right there. Yeah, something I'm kind of curious at, do you notice any interesting differences across the different languages? Um, in terms of, I don't know, anything, is there... Is there a kind of project that a Go programmer would take that would be different from uh, one uh, interested in, say, a Bash shell script? I, so we don't have the answer to that. I know that we did have a, we did see a really, there was no language that skewed, uh, it wasn't skewed to one particular language. It was actually very uh, evenly distributed. That's a data point that I'm going to write down, and we're still in the data mining process. So let me see if I can get back to you on that. And um, and see, see what that is. One thing I'm interested in from you guys is, were, did you come across Oktoberfest at all throughout the month of October, kind of through, the, through your communities? We definitely saw it on Twitter. Um, 
there's a lot of uh, uh, hashtag uh, Oktoberfest going on. That's where I became acquainted with it personally. So, I mean, what, what do you what would you guys think about what if what, what if Oktoberfest was open sourced and you could actually see that data? Is that something that you think that would be interesting and would contribute? Alex, what you're saying, you know, the lack of real data behind uh, open source right now. I think it makes sense to to to, to um push those the data sets out that you that you um were able to uh you know develop from this project i think it'd be immensely helpful because that allows company you know, that allows groups like ourselves to take a look at it and visualize it and analyze it and tell stories about it i mean and like our you know from from our perspective the more the more explanation and analysis that we can do the better off you know you know the more interesting it is right you know and and the more people will be interested in you know, and uh, learning more themselves. Yeah, absolutely. One thing I love seeing on, on the topic of uh, on the topic of just learning in general, uh, we saw a lot of teachers take advantage of Hacktoberfest as a program to get their students. Oh, uh, nice. One that stood out, which was just really awesome to see when the data came back, was a teacher in uh, in what is it, Cedar City, Cedar City's in Utah said that she basically talked about Hacktoberfest and included it in her intro to programming class. And when we look at our data, we actually see 15 individual people. And when we search Cedar City, we <laughs> can see that there were 15 people from City, Cedar City involved in Oktoberfest. Nice. So even stuff like that is what I think they're talking about. Even like little granular geographic and, you know, pull request data would be interesting to see. And that's just what those communities need. You know, they need that. They, you know, I mean, like to have suddenly like a kind of a, you know, of those 15, there's probably only a handful might like who actually come out of it to like maybe, you know, learn more. But still, I mean, that's, um, yeah, that's a nice kind of example of programming and, you know, the open source uh, diaspora, so to speak, you know, where it just spreads out far and wide. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's uh, you know, conversations like these where, you know, I'm able to bring it back to our community team and, uh, you know, we kind of see ourselves as a bit of a, you know, a testing lab, a testing ground for a lot of new ideas. And so I'm definitely going to let them know what you guys are saying. And I'm sure they'll, they'll be hearing this uh, themselves as well. So what's, uh, so, so what's next for you guys? I mean, I mean, I just find the choices of these projects pretty interesting. For instance, the ones on Go, um, uh, they're pretty interesting new projects like Prometheus and Hugo and InfluxDB and Packer and CockroachDB. Did, did this help you guys at all with your own, you know, like bringing this data back to your engineers and sharing that with them and any perspectives that it's helped you kind of, you know, think through about, you know, the services you're delivering? It's just, yeah, totally. And it was it's just, I think it's just one of the, uh, one of the touch points that we're seeing internally, you know, we have our engineers who are working on these projects uh, to incorporate it into our code base. We have our uh, community team of uh, editors and writers who are working with these projects to document them on, you know, our community site with our tutorials. And now we have an extra channel where we can work with them on more of a promotional and public facing communication side and team up and you know to bring bring it to the the, map, the developers that may have never heard of it or you know just get more contributions so we're definitely looking at all those different pieces internally well, what's next then what's next for the project it seems like you got some data to go through first of all you're you're absolutely right about that uh, a whole lot of it um maybe that's a good question have you guys thought about how you're going to analyze this data that is a good question. We do have resources internally to do that. Uh, what, what were you thinking, Alex? Oh, I was just curious on like what you guys are thinking, like on some of the initial discussions about, you know, how to better better understand what this data is telling you. Um, there's a lot of different ways to kind of, you know, you know, uh, look at this information. Well, right now, this is something that we're going to, you know, talk about and kind of distribute the weight of. Mm-hmm. That's why DigitalOcean is in a place where we are, you know, fortunately hiring people to join our team to work on interesting challenges like analyzing data. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's an exciting opportunity. Uh, I think that realistically what we're going to do is just for now get together and um, use some of the engineering prowess on the community team to crunch the data and kind of all look at it and see see what stands out for us. On the, on the more, on the other side of what's going on with Hacktoberfest, 
we got to get those shirts out. Uh, so <laughs> The shirts. People have been asking about the shirts, and we're actually sending them out today. Um, so people will probably be receiving them in uh, December, all throughout December. Whether it's so how many shirts are you sending out in total? Let me give you the exact number. It's five thousand <laughs> seven hundred and uh, eight. <laughs> awesome. Can we out? Wow, that's quite a, you know, you do, you have a retail operation, you need to like, sure, you need to like, uh, get started for the holidays here. <laughs> yeah, fortunately, we've been, we've been perfecting that process for a little while with this, with the swag. Yeah. That's part of why Hacktoberfest happened. People just said they really liked our shirts and wanted them. And when instead of just, you know, aimlessly giving away shirts, I mean, I'm sure you guys have plenty of t-shirts, you don't need another one. But uh, when you kind of add that, you know, you have to work for this. That makes it a little bit more fun. And each year we make the design a little bit different. This year we're going to have the Octocat uh, on the, on the t-shirt, which is really oh, nice. Okay. Well, no, I think I think these I think the the successful startups who've like built a good swag program. So like, there has to be software that they're thinking about building. <laughs> you guys must be thinking about how you can automate these processes to get these t-shirts out faster. Yeah, well, automating these processes is, uh, you know, the, the teams that are going to do that the most efficient ways are certainly going to be at an advantage. <laughs> and, you know, there's a lot of processes to automate with all of Hacktoberfest. And those are just, that's one of the areas that we'll think about looking into Hacktoberfest 2016, where I could, you know, I don't think it's a spoiler if I say that uh, we're going to be doing this next year. Uh, just what it's going to look like is, is probably going to evolve. And we talked about some really interesting things here today that I already am excited to bring back. Great. Well, I guess the, you know, the, 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 one of the last questions I had, the last question I had was like, this seems like it was a pretty good recruiting tool uh, for you guys. Has it proved out? Well, when we look at the, the, the real objective of it, that's not, you know, while we do put that into a lot of the processes that we work on is bringing on the best talent uh, to work with us here. Um, Hacktoberfest started off as uh, just a giving, giving back, initiative and an open source initiative um, it allows us to increase the awareness of DigitalOcean that that's there's no doubt about that as far as website stats go we had about 65,000 to 70 visitors 70,000 visitors throughout the month of October um, visit that platform so you know we're definitely looking at a lot of people checking out DigitalOcean in some way uh, as far as seeing you know who joined Dio from Hacktoberfest? I gotta say honestly, I haven't seen it yet. But maybe I should sync up with our recruiting team. Maybe they have. Maybe we have gotten someone. Yeah, maybe. Well, uh, Joe, any last question you have? Uh, no, no. Uh, I think that was it. It was a good presentation. Uh, great, great work. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Um, well, listen, we'll have, we, you know, we'll follow up with you guys about uh, you know about that data and everything else and. Um, but in the meantime, thanks you guys for taking the time to, uh, you know, to talk with us. Um, maybe at the end here, you just give us a little kind of a, uh, uh, tell us, you know, you guys are the sponsor for this podcast. Tell us a little bit more about DigitalOcean and what you do. Yeah, DigitalOcean is a simple cloud uh, infrastructure provider built uh, for developers and by developers. We, uh, you know, are want to be a part of your stack. Um, and, you know, want to just start a conversation with all developers and show them how simple and easy DigitalOcean is to use. Um, and, you know, we hope and we think that you're going to love it when you try it out. So that's what DigitalOcean is all about. Um, and you can find us at DigitalOcean.com. Excellent. Well, Daniel, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with Joe and I. Joe, thank you for uh, joining me as a co-host for this uh, episode of the New Tech Analysts. Daniel, I'm sure our paths will cross soon, and uh, all the best with getting those t-shirts out. Thank you, guys. All right, thanks a lot. That's it for this week's show. Thank you very much for joining us. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Digital Ocean. Digital Ocean is a simple cloud hosting platform built for developers. You can find them at digitalocean.com. That's D-I-G-I-T-A-L-O-C-E-A-N.com. Audio editing and sound design for the New Stack Analyst podcast is provided by Broken Hours. You can find them at brokenhours.com. 
Thanks again. Hope to see you again for the New Stack Analyst Podcast. Bye-bye.